everybody. The reading today is taken from the book of Samuel, Samuel 1, verses thir- chapter 13, verses 1 to 15. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel for 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines, and the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth-Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel? Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines have come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favour. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Saul left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin, and saw count to the men who were with him. They were numbered six hundred. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Linda. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We ask now that you will help us to understand it and uh, that you will move our hearts and our minds, uh, open our hearts and our minds to your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're in the book of Samuel, one of my favorites. I do like Samuel. I like Samuel 1 and 2. And it's, uh, yeah, some of my great stories in there. And... uh, I'm sure you've been enjoying reading these, uh, but I'm just going to give you a recap of where we are at, okay? So I'm going to quickly go through these uh, first uh, 14 chapters which we've read, okay? You ready for this? Hold on to your seats. Okay, so the book opens with the story of Samuel's birth. His mother Hannah was barren and prayed fervently for a child, vowing to dedicate him to God's service. And God answered her prayer, and um, Samuel was born, and after weaning him, uh, Hannah brought Samuel to serve in the tabernacle in Shiloh under the priest Eli. So then it goes, uh, Eli's wicked sons and God's judgment. So Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, no, not Phinehas and Ferb, but this is Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, were corrupt priests by and abused their position. <clears throat> God judged Eli's house for their wickedness. So then there was Samuel's call. 
Uh, can you remember when he's lying down asleep uh, in the tabernacle and God calls to him about three times? The first two times he goes to Eli and uh, Eli goes, go, go back to your seat, you must be dreaming. And then he kind of discerns after the third time, actually it could be God speaking to him. So he said, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, yes, Lord, your servant is, uh, hears you kind of thing. That's my paraphrased version of it, when it comes a fourth time when God stands by him. And then he hears, well, God's pronouncement of judgment on the house of Eli. Uh, so as the young boy serving in the tabernacles, um, Samuel received his first prophetic call from God, and he becomes a prophet and leader in Israel. Then the Ark of the Covenant gets captured. Uh, the uh, Israelites were in a bit of, uh, you know, um, well... Uh, yeah, up against it, against the Philistines yet again, and the Philistines have uh, beat them, so they thought, I know, why not it's get the Ark of the Covenant um, here, and then we'll definitely win. And so the Ark of the Covenant is brought by Eli's um, sons, comes into the camp, there's a huge cry, and um, then the, the Philistines hear it, and then go, okay, uh, God has just entered the camp, okay, let's fight all the harder, and uh, the Israelites get defeated yet again, and the Ark of the Covenant gets captured, <coughs> and then it goes a, a nice little tour around the Philistine um, towns, causing absolute mayhem. Their, their God falls down, all those kind of things, and so they decide, I think we need to kind of hand it back. Uh, so that's what they did. Meanwhile, Saul becomes king, and the people of Israel demand a king to rule over them like the other nations. Because um, Samuel was getting old, which was really quite rude, really, they said, we want a king like everyone else. And also because his sons were corrupt as well. So Samuel, Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel, but warned the people of the consequences of having a human king. Then early in Saul's reign, um, there is a, there's a narrative really kind of focuses on Saul's reign, including some of his military victories. So he actually started doing stuff, uh, some really good stuff. However, Saul also began to disobey God's commands uh, through Samuel setting the stage for his eventual downfall. And then with the last bit in chapter 14, Saul's son, Jonathan, led a daring attack with his armor bearer uh, against the Philistines, demonstrating faith in God's power that he is still the king to, and had power to deliver Israel even when they are really are up against it. So key themes, God's sovereignty. Even when king, um, Israel demands a king, God remains sovereign while working his purposes through flawed individuals like Saul. There's no one perfect. There is no one perfect. The role of a prophet, uh, Samuel is a pivotal figure representing the transition from God's direct rule to a monarchy. Uh, his role as both prophet and judge demonstrates God's guidance over Israel. He was the last judge. Then it goes on to kings. Uh, human leadership and its limitations. Saul's early successes are quickly overshadowed by his impulsive decisions. Uh, is anyone here impulsive? Yeah, I'm one of those impulsive kind of people as well. Um, so, yeah, where angels, uh, you know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. So that's the, the saying. Sometimes we do get it wrong. Human kingship is far from perfect, and obedience to God remains crucial. We need to do that far more. Faith and courage. Jonathan's story in chapter 14 highlights the individual faith in God's power, contra contrasting with Saul's reliance on his judgment. Got all that? Yeah, for the first 14 chapters, whistle stop tour through that, okay? Now, the Philistines. Philistines are an interesting bunch because they're not actually from, originally from Canaan. They're not listed in the first 
seven nations which Israel was to come in and take Canaan. That's why they was promised. So where are the Philistines from? Anyone know? Good job. I, I, do, I have looked at this to kind of see what, what this... Um, so actually they're called this, um, the sea people. They actually caused a lot of hassle around 12,000 um, 12, B.C. No, 1,200 B.C. The Elite Right, not 12,000 B.C. 1,200 B.C., okay? So they, they uh, caused a lot of tr trouble with the Egyptians, and, uh, and they settled in the Mediterranean, that, that kind of Gaza strip there, okay? Now, you may be uh, mistaken to kind of consider that the Palestinians are the same as the, um, the Philistines. Actually, no, that's not the case. The, uh, historically, these are totally different people, okay? They have, the Philistines have no connection with the Palestinians, okay? You hear that? Because some people teach that the Philistines are the same as the Palestinians, and they're not. The term Palestine itself has a complex origin, but it does not directly connect to the ancient Philistines in the sa same way that people might think. The people was popularized, th this name was popularized by the Roman Empire, Emperor Hadrian, renamed the region Syria Palestinia. In the second century, uh, this uh, renaming came after suppressing a Jewish revolt and was partly intended to raise the Jewish connection to the land by referring, um, well, kind of referring to the, Palis uh, to the Philistines as historic enemies of Israel. But it's still not connected to the Philistines. It was just Hadrian kind of trying to erase the Jewish kind of heritage to that land. So even though it sounds familiar, you know, kind of similar, Palestine, Philistine kind of thing, it is not the same pe uh, people, okay? I just rather, it's really um, more to do with the modern day kind of uh, language of the modern uh, political trying to tie up the Philistines with the Palestinians to actually say this is the reason why we're fighting. It's not historically correct. So I just want to kind of clear that up, all right? So the context of what I actually want to talk about, because I, I did want to talk about chapter 15, uh, 14, but um, the Lord had other ideas. And so the context of Saul's situation here from our reading. Saul finds himself in a tense situation. The Philistines are gathering in overwhelming numbers. Yeah, you couldn't count them how many there were against Israel. And he only had, had about uh, 4,000 men, I think, or 6,000 men altogether. And they were numerous, the Philistines against so, in the response, many scatter and hide, and Saul is uh, supposed to wait for Samuel to actually kind of help them go into battle, to know how to fight. So, he was waiting. He was told to wait for at least seven days. Now, this isn't the first time he was asked to wait. He waited seven days before, but he was up against it here because his army was melting away. So Samuel had set a time for his arrival of seven days. And by the seventh day, Saul was still waiting. And the situation seemed to be getting worse. The army was dwindling. Samuel had not yet appeared. Saul became anxious. And in a moment of panic, he took the matters into his own hands and offered the burnt offering himself. Something only the priest could do. Almost immediately after Saul finished... Samuel turned up. It's typical, isn't it? Whenever, whenever you're something you shouldn't be doing, somewhere, yeah, or yeah, you're kind of, all oh, right, I, I've got to do this, and that the person who is supposed to be have that job comes, uh, turns up. It's really quite annoying, isn't it? Don't you think? Now, I really kind of actually sympathize with Saul here. Even though he got it wrong, 
and he had uh, not followed the, the law that allowing the priest uh, to only sacrifice, he was up against it. He, were, he had already had victories against the Philistines, and so the pressure was on from the people to perform. That, and if you read when he was made king, they said, oh, so you can, uh, we want a king so they can fight our battles for us. So I, I, I really kind of, uh, yeah, kind of sympathize with Saul being under that kind of pressure because sometimes it feels like that as a leader, to perform, to make it work, to fill the church with people as though it's my responsibility only. The pressure is on sometimes. You see, I want, to, I want to ask the question, what are we waiting for as a church? What are we have expectations of the Lord? What, what is going through your own mind of what you expect of the church? But the thing is, it's, it, there were, that same question reflects on me. What am I waiting for? What do I want to see happen? The temptation to work it out to manufacture rather than wait. Because like Saul was facing fears and expectations, the people want answers and results and the pressure is on for Saul to perform. And waiting is painful. Does anyone like waiting? Who's patient here? Anyone patient? Really patient? Yeah, you all, all you, well, you've learned patience then. You've learned that, that patience because I'm not one who is patient. I want it to happen now. But waiting is really painful. We often miss out on the best because we're trying to make something happen with our own enthusiasm or our spiritual fervor to almost strong arm the Lord into what we want to see happen rather than his own will to be done. We pray every Sunday the Lord's Prayer, your will be done, but we work like it's our will to be done. So the pain of waiting waiting is painful. There's a raw vulnerability in not being able to control our outcomes. Who likes to be in control of everything? Yeah, we like to be in control. <laughs> Thank you, Monty. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> we like to be, it would be awesome to have control over everything. Nothing goes wrong, wouldn't it? To have every minutiae all sorted. But yet waiting is often we discover our own limitations and more importantly, God's sufficiency. Think of Jesus' words in John 15 where Jesus says, the, the Father is the gardener and I'm the vine and you are the branches. Yes? So it says that Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. So if we can't do anything, why do we try and work like we can work without him? We so often do that. Rather than remaining in him, because he says he abides in us and he wants us to abide in him the same way. To remain, to be, to be vitally united to him because he is vitally united to us. So he wants the same experience for us. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's a reminder that fruit we long to see can't be forced by grow, uh, but grows organically when we are connected to him. No matter how much I go, I can't produce the fruit. All right? I can't force it to happen just by my sheer willpower. 
I'm more likely to, you know, to do other things, to go, go, do myself a mischief by doing that. No one can force the fruit. It is only by remaining, by abiding in the vine, by vi being vitally united to Jesus, that we can actually produce fruit. And we've just been reading in Galatians, where it says you bite and devour one another. Because, you know, at, and it's the reason being is because they are not producing any fruit. We should be like fruit trees walking around. And people can pick the fruit off you because you're exuding the, you know, the kind of love, joy, peace, um, gentleness, faithfulness, and all the other ones, all right? <laughs> Honestly, that's, you know, but they bite and devour because they are hungry. That's because there is no fruit amongst them. We need to be people of, that are fruitful, and it is only by remi uh, remaining in Jesus that we can be fruitful. The waiting pe uh, period teaches us dependence over diligence and faithfulness over fast results. We live in a world that is so quick, so fast. Instant, instant coffee and stuff like that. Now, I grew up with the uh, ZX Spectrum. Anyone had the ZX Spectrum? Now, these ones are really, uh, yeah, you would have to you have a tape um, recorder. And you put the tape in for the program, all right? Yeah, and you kind of, you, you can see why, like, half an hour later, it might load, <laughs> all right? If it doesn't, you have to go through the whole process again. Now, the modern day uh, kind of like PlayStation 5 and Xbox and stuff like that are instantaneous. In fact, you get... Why is it taking so long to load? When we used to be, wait for that half an hour, go and make toast, have a cup of tea, and come back and hope it would work. We're living in a world that is so, can't wait for anything. So the puzzle is, why does God's timing feel so out of sync with our own expectations? Yes, there you are, Ezra. Yeah. The puzzle could be summed up. If God is all-knowing and has a perfect plan, why does his timing seal, uh, feel so unpredictable and often painfully slow? He is really painfully slow sometimes. This inconsistency reveals itself in almost every aspect of faith, especially in our conversations about waiting and, wait, and wanting to see results, whatever those results are. We are called to trust God's timing, yet his timeline often feels like a mismatch with the urgency we feel or the expectations placed on us. We want to see everyone saved, but it's not our job to save. It's our job to signpost. Jesus is the one who saves. This anomaly surfaces when we observe how much we desire answers and closure. How much we want to make sense. Like a puzzle, every piece has its place. And the whole picture should fit together. But when we wait on God, we feel like some pieces are missing. Or worse, we're trying to force the pieces, our own pieces, that don't belong. We're trying to make a puzzle with our own work. So why doesn't he respond to our timetable? We've got, yeah, we've got the newsletter here. We know what the timetable is. We've got dates here and everything what goes on. Yeah, you know everything what's going on in here. But really, with God, it's not as straightforward as this. Not saying that we don't make plans. We have a structure. But we really need to be open to what the Lord is wanting to do. It's not just this. 
So here's the irony. We try to rush the one who has never hurried. I love that saying in um, uh, Gandalf uh, about the wizard. He says, the wizard is never late. He arrives exactly on the time he desires kind of thing. That's my paraphrase of that one. Yeah, he turns up when he wants to. And pretty much the same as God, really. He is not a tame lion, as C.S. Lewis says. We, he is not someone who is bent to our own will. We want to use our fervor or skills to press forward, often uh, believing our actions might bring about his will faster. Yet God's ways are unhurried for a reason. They work at a rhythm of what leads to growth. Not what is measured or visible sometimes, but the attempt to control or hurry God is almost comical. With all our limitations of who we are, we hope to move the heart of the one who moves the cosmos. That's ludicrous, trying to change. Who are you to tell God what he should be or what he should do? Does the clay strive with its maker and say, what are you making? No. The irony becomes even more apparent when we recognize our attempt to close the gap by pushing our own timelines of often leads to frustration, disappointment, or outcomes that fall short of God's best. The inconsistency here lies in competing with God's, well, completing God's puzzle with our own pieces rather than letting him peace, uh, place every piece in its time. So though it may feel elusive, the solution to the problem, uh, well, to the problem of our puzzle is recognizing that we are invited to wait with God. We're invited to wait with him, not merely for him. In each season of waiting, he is teaching us to align our pace with his, to find contentment in the gaps and to rest in his sovereignty. Waiting becomes a spiritual practice where we enjoy each piece as it is revealed instead of trying to complete the puzzle. The process might feel slow or incomplete, but it leads us to a more profound reliance on God and a fuller picture that we could create ourselves. So what do we gain in the waiting? By wrestling with the, this kind of puzzle, puzzle of divine timing, we're invited to shift from a results-orientated mindset to one of faithful presence. We might even begin to see waiting as an active posture where we are fully present with God and with each other, open to learn from waiting rather than just enduring it how many of us just endure waiting i wait i endure, endure waiting by eating stuff i comfort eat when things aren't working the way i want it to be hence why i need to go to back to swimming world but hey <laughs> This shift can bring peace, trust, and resilience, equipping us to face life's uncertainties with a feeling pressured to complete the puzzle prematurely. So, so perhaps the puzzle isn't meant to be solved in a traditional sense. Instead, it invites us to dwell on the questions, growing closer to God as we embrace the mystery of his timing the discipline of an unhurried life we've studied uh, in the past of john mark comer's book the ruthless elimination of hurry and i keep on coming back to this we are so rushing around we're like headless chickens trying to compete with so many things 
when really he wants us to slow down, to simplify, to embrace silence and solitude. And to come to his pacing. We are too busy running ahead of the Lord rather than walking in step with him. So we need the ruthless elimination of hurry. We need to embrace the waiting. Not endure it, but actually to learn from it. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are God which is not in a hurry. And, our Lord, we, uh, you know we want things now. But sometimes you say, not yet. Wait. And it's in the waiting that we get to know you more. So help us to slow down, to chill out, to come alongside you as you are alongside us and learn to be and not to do. From out of the being, we learn to what we need to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.